So uh, let me say this is an honor and a privilege to introduce you to David Seaman, uh, our keynote speaker giving the, our, our, the SPHS keynote is the George Sathis Lecture. Um, and speaking of George Sathis, on our website George does a history of SPHS and I'm happy to, you know, to have David as a keynote since uh, George recognizes him as one of the founding members of SPHS, although we've talked about this before. Uh, David doesn't want to admit to being a founding member, maybe just an early member here. So um, it's also, I think, an important testament to having David as a keynote uh, that representing the interdisciplinarity of SPHS, how uh, David's home discipline being uh, training in geography and then a, a position of uh, architecture in uh, at Kansas State University, but also a, a philosopher as well. So uh, that sort of interdisciplinarity of SPHS, I think, is represented by, um, by David. So David uh, got his bachelor's from, from SUNY and a doctorate from Clark University in geography, like I said. He is an author or editor of over eight books, uh, including A Geography of the Life World, which was just reprinted. Uh, he's the author of over 100 articles. Uh, he's actually working on a new book project uh, called Life Takes Place. Um, he's a member of numerous, too numerous to mention in terms of editorial boards. He's also the editor of the Environmental and Architectural Phenomenology newsletter, which I think there's still a couple of hard copies uh, upstairs on the second floor available. Um, his interests are aesthetics, art, architecture, place, urban studies, phenomenology, Goethe, phenomenological method, nature of environmental experience. Uh, nature and environmental experience, photography, pop culture, Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, uh, all these is from the, the skimming of the articles of, that he's published. Uh, it's amazing the amount of productivity that David has produced and really some uh, important work in, in the field of, of phenomenology of place. And I'm really excited to have him here giving his keynote, Finding Merleau-Ponty in Architecture and in Place. Can you please welcome David Seaman? Uh, Eric, first, thank you. Um, I first attended SPEP and SPHS in 1981. And I was just talking to Bob Mugerauer because we organized a session that year. And I think that meeting was in uh, Evanston, Illinois at Northwestern. Though it might have been at Penn State. I, I, I can't remember. But what I do remember is uh, the presence of Larry Weeder, who was a sociologist down at the University of Oklahoma, and George, George Sathis, who was a sociologist at uh, Boston University. And uh, they were the two figures keeping the conference running smoothly, just as you are doing so elegantly uh, this year. And over the years, George uh, was a major force in keeping SPHS running. And uh, therefore, I feel honored to be able to provide the keynote in his uh, recognition tonight. I'm calling this talk Finding Merleau-Ponty in Architecture and in Place. And right at the start, I want to mention that most of the black and white photographs you'll be seeing in the presentation are by the eminent Hungarian American photographer Andre Kertész, who's one of the great figures of 20th century photography. And I make use of Kertész in the talk because to me, he is a photographer of the life world. And I've written on that topic considerably. I'm only going to use the images tonight. But what I'm trying to do through the images to, is to evoke uh, a certain amount of feeling as well as a certain amount of cerebral awareness. I guess in uh, Ian McGilchrist's uh, terms, I'm trying to activate both right and left brains. <laughs> what I want to do in the talk is to um, ask the question as to how Merleau-Ponty's thinking is relevant to architectural and place concerns. Uh, this is really not a novel topic. In the last several years, as probably many of you know, uh, 
there have been quite a number of publications looking into this possibility. The most recent is, a, uh, is an edited collection that architect uh, Rachel McCann and uh, Patricia Locke have done called Merleau-Ponty Space Place Architecture, which is published by Ohio State University Press. I am interested in Merleau-Ponty because, uh, as Eric said, I'm trained in geography, and more precisely, I'm trained in what is called environment behavior research, the study of the mutual relationship between people and the environment, particularly the material, the designed environments. And at Kansas State, uh, I have fallen in with the architects, which I never would have imagined when I started my doctoral work. And my major responsibility there is to uh, get the design students to realize the crucial significance of the designed environment in human well-being. And very early on in my doctoral career, I became enamored of the phenomenological approach. It really is the only approach academically that makes sense to me. And I was lucky to work with a young geographer named Dan Bottomer who had studied at the Husserlian archives and was very interested in thinking through how phenomenology could be used in terms of environmental uh, topics. And uh, over the years, uh, that has been my entire emphasis. And these are the kinds of topics that I'm interested in. I'm not going to read through all these, but I did want to give you a kind of uh, top of the funnel so that I can move down in to uh, Merleau-Ponty proper and explain more exactly where I want to head. What I want to do is to uh, use Merleau-Ponty's thinking as a way to amplify the work of two important figures in architecture and place research. First, I'm going to talk about the work of Norwegian architect Thomas Lise Venson and uh, his theory of architectural archetypes. And then I'm going to talk about the work of British architectural theorist Bill Hillier and his theory of space syntax. And what I want to argue is that on one hand, Merleau-Ponty's ideas amplify the ideas of these two figures. And on the other hand, their ideas uh, bring interesting new insights to the possibilities that Merleau-Ponty offers. First, let me say a little bit about Merleau-Ponty. I guess I find Merleau-Ponty so fascinating because he tries to answer a question which I remember wondering about when I was four or five years old. You know, how is it that the world is always already present? I, as a child, I, 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 this seemed to be some kind of miracle. And of course, a good number of phenomenologists explore this question in various ways. But certainly Merleau-Ponty argues that there is some kind of lived entwinement between uh, human beings and the world. In other words, we are somehow entwined in the world and the world entwined in us. And of course, the core, at least in phenomenology of perception, and let me just say I'm mostly going to draw on the perspective of that work, uh, is perception, which Merleau-Ponty defines in, a, in, an, in an innovative way by the immediate givenness of the world, as he writes a whole already pregnant with an irreducible meaning. In turn, perception is grounded in the lived body, and I would define the lived body as a body that simultaneously experiences, acts in, and is aware of a world that normally responds with immediate presence. And again, he writes, my bo body is the fabric into which all objects are woven, and it is the general instrument of my comprehension. And of course, here in this passage, we run into one of his major images, 
the idea that life is a fabric and the relationship between people and world is this interweaving or this intertwining. In turn, there are other important uh, concepts, uh, the perceptual field, or sometimes it's translated as the phenomenal field, this interpenetrating web of sensory and bodily presence and relationship. As he writes, the perceptual something is always in the middle of something else and it always forms part, always forms part of a field. I admire this photograph by Andre Cortez very much in this regard because I think when most folks look at this, they think, oh, it's some kind of abstract modernist painting. But then, as you begin to give it more attention and your perceptual field begins to get more organized, you realize that in the center there is a bird landing. And then you begin to realize that these dark diagonals are the markings of a staircase. And uh, there must be a demolish, a building has been demolished and the bird is landing on the ground where that demolished building was uh, constructed originally. But I like the way we, 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 we have to keep looking and eventually be, we begin to see uh, more and more. Also important is, is synesthetic perception, the intertwining of the senses so that we don't just see or we don't just hear or we don't just touch, but always already they are synergized. They are a, an experienced uh, wholeness. So this photograph, uh, we feel the wetness of the water. Thiessa Benson, I want to move into his work now, and I bring up Thiessa Benson in this talk because what he's attempting to do is to locate the perceptual, visceral, unselfconscious, pre-reflective level whereby we encounter. And of course, he is encountering as an architect buildings. So we can call this work, and he says this himself, he's attempting to do a phenomenology of architectural experience as encountered through the lived body. This book was originally published in 1987. Unfortunately, it is not that well known. It was originally a dissertation that uh, Thiessa Benson did under the direction of Christian Norbert Schultz. And some of you probably know that Christian Norbert Schultz is a major figure in what has come to be called architectural phenomenology. What is Thiessa Benson's key argument? I want to make three points. First of all, he argues that architecture is the making of an inside in the midst of an outside. And this is quite an apt phenomenological definition that somehow buildings, buildings in their very constitution create an in and an out. Second point, the architectural elements that define inside and outsideness are floor, wall, and roof. The floor, through above and beneath, the wall, through within and around, and the roof, through over and below. Third, the inside-outside relationship is expressed by three existential qualities, as these events and calls them. Motion, weight, and substance. By motion, he means the sense of dynamism or inertia of the building and its parts. For example, does the building seem to be sinking? Does it seem to be rising? Does it seem to be uh, uh, floating? What, what, what is that visceral evocation that the building is offering us? A very simple example with the wall, uh, the stick figure is the experiencer. And even though this convex wall is obviously a lifeless static thing, just by being curving outward, it does evoke a sense of motion outward. On the other hand, we have the uh, concave wall. And uh, the visceral sense for the stick figure experiencing the concave wall is to move into it. Uh, perhaps because it evokes a sense of shelter or a sense of um, security. But there's a difference here in motion uh, expansion versus a kind of contraction. Next, we have weight, the sense of lightness or heaviness of the building and its parts. 
Does the building seem overbearing? Does it seem etheric? Does it seem anchored in place? The example here, again, very simple in terms of the roof. The uh, ceiling uh, vaulted, uh, the pointed vaulted ceiling of the uh, Gothic cathedral, for example, which evokes a sense of motion upward and a sense of levity, lightness in other words. Here, the heavy lintel with the rather feeble walls supporting the lintel. Uh, the stick figure perhaps hesitates. Perhaps the stick figure won't even go through because there's this quality of potential collapse or danger. And of course, this is a motif that the ancient Egyptian used in uh, many of their tombs to evoke symbolically the great difference between this present world and the world after death. Finally, substance, the material sense of the building and its parts. Uh, is there a sense of softness, hardness, brightness, coarseness? The example, floor, again, very simple. The difference experientially in walking over a wooden bridge versus walking over a stone bridge. That brings us to Thesa Benson's key question. And when I'm teaching this to my architecture students, I make them stand up and uh, say this over and over again as a mantra. How do floor, wall, and roof express insideness and outsideness through motion, weight, and substance? That really is the core query for Thesa Benson. And what I want to do is to illustrate this quickly through the wall, remembering that he also talks about floor and roof, but I'm not going to say much about them because we only have uh, uh, 50 minutes. Wall. These are the kinds of questions that would be asked. How does the wall speak as a wall? How does the wall express the inside-outside relationship? How does the wall express motion, weight, and substance? Here, for example, we have the uh, Palazzo Strozzi, a Renaissance uh, urban house in Florence. And when you look at the architectural criticism of this particular building, you run into words like stern, imposing, arrogant, formidable, powerful. And in fact, the, the, uh, the client for the house wanted a building which evoked the power and prestige of the Strozzi family. And I think uh, the family got that from the architects involved with the building. However, the question that Thesa Benson is addressing is, can we somehow begin to understand why words like this are used to, uh, to uh, describe the building. Now, in terms of wall, Thesa Benson says we have to look at two aspects. First of all, we have to look at the wall in terms of its degree of openness or closure. Secondly, its relative strength of inside and outside. Now, what does this mean? Well, the first one, I think, is fairly self-explanatory. What we're talking about here is the degree of physical and visual connectedness or permeability between inside and outside. So this house above obviously has a good amount of connectedness, both vis visual and physical, between inside and outside. Whereas this structure, which is an early Frank Lloyd Wright uh, house, uh, this, there's much more a sense of separation between inside and outside. From outside, uh, we, we, we discover very little about the inside. And of course, this was intentional on Wright's part because he used this separation to uh, strengthen the uh, privacy of the family uh, within. Relative strength of inside and outside, a little more, a little less obvious. Uh, we can talk about the strength of the inside or the strength of the outside. When we talk about the strength of the inside, we're talking about the degree to which the wall brings the inside out. On the other hand, the strength of the outside, the degree to which the wall brings the outside in. So this uh, Baroque church in uh, Oaxaca, Mexico, uh, this is a very nice example of the strength of the outside. This concave wall is bringing the outside in. Just by its cur curving inward, there's this visceral sense of moving toward and in. Whereas here, this department store, very cleverly designed in terms of a series of uh, glazed 
uh, convex bays. And of course, this provides a nice way to uh, display the merchandise within to the would-be shoppers walking along the sidewalk. And this is a, a lovely example of uh, the strength of the inside. In other words, the wall is bringing the inside out. If we look at the Strozzi, uh, the Palazzo Strozzi here, uh, not too much is being evoked in terms of the strength of the inside versus the strength of the outside. So I want you to understand each building is going to be unique in terms of this evocation of inside-outside in its various dimensions. Thesa Benson says in order to understand this relationship more precisely, we need to recognize that the wall evokes these qualities in three ways, horizontally, vertically, and directly, in terms of approaching the building and moving into it. And let me just say right now, in archetypes in architecture, uh, Thesa Benson is doing a phenomenology of being outside the building, <coughs> being able to see the full entry facade of the building, and moving toward it. That's what he's co concerned with. Obviously, there is another half to this the experience of being in the building and coming out. But he says very little about that portion of the phenomenon. He says, you know, that's really a separate book. It's a separate project. I've been trying to get doctoral students to do that for years, but so far, no takers. But it would make a fascinating uh, study. Now, we have these three different ways of evoking the inside-outside relationship in motion, weight, and substance. And he calls these themes. So we have breadth, which relates to the horizontal expression. We have height relating to the vertical expression. And we have depth relating to the direct approach and going in expression. I want to illustrate height, because I think this is the easiest to uh, pick up quickly. So when we talk about the height theme, we're asking uh, what the vertical sense of the building is in terms of inside, outside, and motion, weight, and substance. We're asking how the building speaks in relation to sky and earth. We're asking questions as to whether the building seems to move upward or whether the building seems to sink. Uh, we're asking questions about the uh, experienced weight of the building. So these are the kinds of questions that we look at when we study height. To get an answer to height, uh, Thesa Benson does what I would call a hermeneutic phenomenology of the history of architecture. In other words, he looks at a great number of buildings in different times and different places, both high architecture as well as vernacular architecture. And he says, you know, if we look at all of these buildings over time and in different places, we realize that there are four major ways in which this vertical expression comes forward architecturally. And these are the four ways, rising, sinking, squeezed, and open. Now, let me just go back, oops. Let me go back here because I did forget to make a point that's very important. Notice in discussing height and breadth, the wall is imaged in terms of three fields, side fields and a middle field. And some critics have uh, attacked these events and for this, saying this is a rather arbitrary way to look at a wall. I think, however, experientially it does make sense because a wall has sides whether left and right or top, bottom, and it has, a, it has a kind of middle. So you have these three fields. You might call them three fields of energy. And uh, they become very important for height. So here, for example, with these four possibilities in the history of architecture, as I say, the rising, the sinking, the squeezed, and the open. Now let me just show you what they are each. The rising motif. In the rising motif, the middle field is pushed upward by the bottom field. So the evocation is that the wall seems well anchored and heavy, yet upright and free. Therefore, it's very interesting. You have both solidity and, uh, solidity and uh, levity 
uh, groundedness and freedom evoked in the rising motif. You see this motif in uh, many of the Gothic cathedrals. This is Notre Dame, and it's very easy, a bottom field, a middle field, the top field, the top of the two, two, two towers. And clearly, there is this quality of the building going up. And of course, this was intentional on the part of the Gothic builders to evoke a kind of spiritual ascension. You also see the rising motif in uh, many of the great uh, Renaissance palazzi. This is the Palazzo Farnese in Rome. I put this one in here. This is a palladio. But it is very interesting in the rising motif. Very often, the third field dissolves. It becomes so light that in this case, it becomes nothing but the statuary along the roof. So here is your bottom field, your middle field, and then pure etheric. And even a building, this is uh, Frank Gehry's um, Bilbao Museum in Bilbao, Spain. And obviously, you cannot break this evenly into three fields, but I think the overall impact of the uh, building evokes the rising motif. It's like the petals of a flower opening up. Uh, so this is the rising motif. And then you have the uh, sinking motif, which is its opposite in a way, where the middle field is pushed downward. So the building has a sense of weight and gravity. Uh, typically, all other things being equal, there's going to be a much more severe separation between inside and outside. You might have a sense of shelter and protection, or you might have a sense of collapse and threat. Here, for example, this is a church by uh, Le Corbusier. And notice this would be the uppermost field. This would be the middle field. Very often in the sinking motif, the downward motion is so great that the third field is pushed into the earth, just as the, the top field in the rising motif is pulled up into the <laughs> ether. Then we have the squeeze motif. And here, the poor middle field is overwhelmed by both the top and the bottom field. Uh, the wall appears to be snapping shut. And this is a motif that Frank Lloyd Wright especially was uh, clever with in the prairie school houses. Notice in both these houses, uh, the topmost field becomes the roof. But it is true. The roof seems to be pushing down. This seems to be pushing up. Uh, this is recessed, the middle field. So you have, uh, th th this contributes to this expression of separation between inside and outside. And then we have the complete opposite, which is the open motif. And here, the middle field is the uh, macho uh, energy field. And uh, the middle field seems to be both pushing up and pushing down. And this motif is interesting, of course, because it evokes a great amount of connectedness between inside and outside. And you see this early on in the classical temple. So the uh, base, the style of bait, is the uh, lowest field, the middle field marked by the columns, and the topmost field uh, marked by the, the pediment and the entablature. Now, Thies de Vincen, uh, does the same thing for breadth, and I'm not going to go through this in detail. But again, he says, you know, if we look at the history of buildings, we again find four major motifs. Uh, a situation where the middle field dominates breadth, a situation where the side fields dominate split, a situation where the right or left side dominates. And these three, typically, all other things being equal again, much more separation between inside and outside, whereas here, uh, much connectedness between inside and outside. When I'm teaching these events to my architecture students, I uh, give them a series of uh, exercises and these are sheets I hand out in relation to the uh, height theme and the breadth theme. And it's a fairly simple thing to do. You have to figure out which of the eight buildings is which. And I'm fairly decent at it after, gosh, how many years, 20 years of studying these events. And, but uh, it, you, you, you really need to reach a point where you look at the building and all these parts are instantaneously seen together. And 
to do that, I first get the students to uh, look at both height and breadth simultaneously. And one building I give some attention to is this handsome little Carnegie Library in upstate New York. And I find this design so simple and yet so clever because you'll notice in terms of breadth, it's a split motif. Can everybody see that? This is one side field with the bay windows, the other side field, and this is the middle field here. So in terms of, um, in terms of breadth, you have the split motif, which, which generates a certain amount of separation between inside and outside. But in terms of height, you have an open motif. You have the bottom field here with the rusticated stone foundation. You have the middle field marked by the height of the columns. And then you have the topmost field here. And of course, the open motif evokes a sense of connectedness between inside and outside. So you have a design which evokes both difference and um, permeability, which I think is quite clever in terms of a library, you know, because it is a public institution and you want the public to go in and feel a sense of entry. And yet, on the other hand, it's a library and it should be a place of privacy and quiet. So it's very clever how the architect uh, worked this through. Now, no doubt he didn't think this all through consciously. I mean, I think the best designers intuit all this automatically. But I do think it's very interesting how Fisa Vincent's language allows us to look at a building and begin to see qualities which perhaps we haven't seen before. Now, there are many buildings which really don't make much sense in terms of breadth and height. So, for example, this is Wright's uh, Kaufman House in western Pennsylvania. And uh, that brings us into depth, which is the third uh, aspect of the wall. And this is much more complex than breadth and uh, height. And essentially, he talks about depth in terms of the main form, in terms of the building system, and in terms of openings, that is, doors and windows. I just want to introduce openings a bit because I think this section on doors and windows in Thesa Venson is perhaps the most creative portion of the book. And he does take a traditional classical anthropocent anthropocentric uh, view toward doors and windows. He says that the door relates the outside to the inside, the penetration of outside in, whereas the window relates the inside to the outside, the penetration of the inside out. So he is suggesting that the door is the mouth of the building, the windows are the eyes, and he says this quite directly. The window is the symbol of what is inside. It is a kind of eye. It expresses the insides looking out or not to the world outside. Windows announce our way of life. Again, to more precisely explore how the window evokes what degree of insideness and outsideness and motion, weight, and substance. He says we need to look at three aspects of the window. First of all, the opening. First of all, what is the shape of the opening? Is it vertically rectangular? Is it horizontally rectangular? Is it centered? Secondly, the profile. The profile refers to the way the window is cut into the wall. Is it cut in perpendicularly or is it splayed in some way? In other words, is, is it angled? Face. He says the face is very important. In other words, the glass itself. If the face is deep within the wall, that evokes more a sense of separation between inside and outside. Whereas if the face is uh, exactly in the middle, the relationship is neutral. If the face is flush with the outer surface of the wall, the quality is of the, insi of, of, of the inside pushing out. And then finally, the frame. And I wanted to say a little bit about the frame because I do think this is rather clever in how he presents it. Uh, just as with a picture frame, he says that the window frame provides a setting for the inside. In other words, the frame increases the importance of the inside space and brings it out toward the onlooker. 
He also says that the window without a frame is like a gaping hole. So rather than the inside coming out, the outside rushes in. And this uh, upsets the sense of difference within uh, the building. He talks about variations in the frame. So if you have a complete frame, in other words, you have a sill, you have a lintel, you have the two jams, uh, there's a straightforward motion toward the experiencer. On the other hand, if the sill is emphasized, and you see it here, this adds downward weight to the building, all other things being equal. So the, the, there's this visceral sense of the wall going downward. Whereas if the lintel is emphasized, it's the opposite. It lightens the wall and generates a visceral sense of movement upward. And then finally, we have a situation where the jams are emphasized. I don't have a drawing of that here. But he says that when the jams are emphasized, this contributes to a sense of, of horizontal uh, movement. I could say a great deal more about Merleau-Ponty, but uh, about these events. But I do want to bring him back to the original topic. That is the relationship between his work and Merleau-Ponty. And again, uh, what I'm trying to argue is that each amplifies the other, because what Thies Evensen is attempting is a uh, phenomenology of architecture grounded in lived corporeality. Let me just say, he, he is not saying that the only dimension of architectural encounter or meaning is this perceptual, visual, vi visceral dimension. Actually, he speaks of two other dimensions of architectural meaning. He talks about the, the uh, personal dimension of meaning, which gets into personal taste and liking and disliking. He talks about the uh, social dimension of uh, architecture, which would get into a cultural, religious, political meanings evoked by the building. However, he says there is this third dimension, the archetypal dimension. And he links the archetypal dimension to material sensuousness and visceral presence. So he's talking about an architectural encounter happening at a pre-reflective level of awareness. In other words, uh, that perceptual uh, field level that Merleau-Ponty is talking about. Now, I n now want to move on to uh, Bill Hillier. And uh, in getting to his work, I want to make the point that ultimately in Merleau-Ponty, he talks about a continuum. On the other hand, you have the passive, well, I should say the more passive perceptual dimension. And I've tried to evoke that through Lisa Venson's work. However, you also have the active motor dimension. And uh, I have become interested in Bill Hillier's work because uh, Bill Hillier is interested in how one aspect of the world, the spatial configuration of pathways, plays a role in natural movement. So that's where I want to go with this. But let me just say about uh, Bill Hillier, um, he is British. Uh, the first full explication of the space syntax theory was written in uh, 1984, The Social Logic of Space, which he uh, co-authored with Julian Hansen. And then he wrote Space is the Machine in 1996. But Bill has probably written over a thousand articles. And I find his work some of the most creative uh, research in uh, architectural and spatial theory going on today. However, let me emphasize, he is not a phenomenologist. Uh, he is an empirical scientist. And he's very keen on measurement. However, I have argued in a number of writings that there's a very important phenomenological component to his discoveries. And that's what I want to get to. But first, I need to say a little more about the active motor dimension of the lived body. And of course, here we run into uh, the body schema, or the body subject, as I call it, which refers to the pre-reflective corporeal awareness manifested through action, and typically in sync with 
and enmeshed in the physical world in which the action unfolds. And of course, one of the awkwardnesses of this expression, body subject, is that it readily pushes one back into a, into a people world dual, dualism. Uh, and somehow we have to keep in mind that this bodily phenomenon is always enmeshed in the world. And there's a, an intimate uh, envelopment between uh, body and world. And I think, well, uh, yeah, I mean, this is the reason why eventually Merleau-Ponty left the language and phenomenology of perception and moved toward uh, chiasm and crossing over and, um, and flesh. Um, and of course, Merleau-Ponty uh, links the body subject with uh, habit and routine. He says a movement is learned when the body has understood it, when it has incorporated it into its world. And what I'm interested in as a geographer and as an environment behavior researcher working with designers is the possibility of place choreographies. In other words, extended bodily ensembles, which might fashion a wider lived geography. I've always been puzzled as to why Merleau-Ponty didn't push the body subject uh, scheme in, in this direction. Um, he does talk about the lady with the feather in her hat, and he talks about the blind man with his walking stick, and he does talk about mastering his apartment in terms of moving around it, but it, as far as I know, in none of his work does he talk about the, the reasonable possibility that, that this stratum of the lived body is responsible for so much of uh, daily uh, uh, actions. There is a, a, an intriguing uh, passage in the uh, preface of uh, Phenomenology Perception where he says, the paths of my various experiences intersect, and also my own and other people's intersect and engage each other like gears. And again, you know, the gears image, this idea of intertwinement and uh, folding over, which it parallels the, the, the fabric and weaving image. But I don't know of any place in Merleau-Ponty where, where he, he, he pointed toward these uh, larger scaled um, actions. Now, turning to uh, Hillier, as I've said, uh, Hillier's key interest is how qualities of spatiality of the world contribute to human life, or phenomenologically to the life world. Specifically, he is interested in the spatial configuration of pathways. Now, let me explain what this means. One way to summarize uh, Hillier's focus is permeability. In other words, the ease of physical movement through a place, the number of alternative routes running through a place. Looking at these two neighborhoods, I think it's quite clear that this neighborhood is less permeable than this one. So if I'm living here in the red triangle and I want to go over here, I can, probably I would get in my car here because of the cul-de-sac. I would get in my car and I would drive this way or I would drive uh, this way. Now, of course, there's always a smart, smart, smart aleck in my s class and he raises his hand and he says, yeah, but Professor Seaman, I would just walk between the two. <laughs> well, okay, but you know, probably there would be fences and outbuildings and other obstacles. So I'm not sure how reasonable that is, but certainly in terms of the pathway structure, there are only two routes between the triangles. Whereas here, with the circles, obviously there are quite a, quite a number of more routes. I could go this way, 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 I could even go around this way if I had to get to the drugstore, which is on the corner here. Uh, so, it's this idea of how the pathway configuration leads to different manners of movement that Hillier is interested in. And he calls this natural movement. 
how people move through a pathway system just because of the way in which the pathways are structured. So for example, here we have a uh, uh, medieval hill town village in uh, southern France. And he, uh, he argues that the manner, of move, the manner of potential movement through this little village is going to be different than the manner of movement uh, through this uh, gridded street pattern, what's called a rectilinear grid, or is yet again different than this lolly, lollipops and loop uh, suburban development pathway structure. And uh, his work begins partly in southern France as he begins to study these uh, trading village, uh, villages uh, founded in medieval times. And he asks the question, is there some kind of underlying structure to these uh, villages? And as he uh, studies the villages in more detail, he realizes that there is this underlying pattern for most of these villages. It's what he calls the beady ring structure. And these are four features of the BD ring structure. First of all, all the building entries uh, access directly onto the public space of the village, which typically would be a street or a plaza of some sort. The village open space is continuous but irregular. It narrows and widens like beads on a string. Third, this space joins back on itself to form irregularly shaped rings, ringiness. The ring structure and the buildings abutting the street directly give the village a high degree of permeability. And I've just marked three of the rings here in red, but obviously there are many loops. And you can also see, look at this street, for example, it's fairly narrow here, it widens, it widens more, widens, becomes a plaza, narrows, narrows, widens. So it's that irregular beadiness. So we have the beady ring structure. However, Hillier is not happy with this. He says this is entirely descriptive. Can we begin to uh, measure the variation in the outdoor pathway space in the village? And he develops a series of uh, remarkably creative concepts that no one has gotten to before. The most important in terms of the layout of the spaces is what he calls axial space. And axial space refers to the one-dimensional quality of any space. So this room, for example, to, to create the axial space for this room, it would be a line running here. Uh, this is how you uh, convert an irregular pathway structure like this village into an axial map. You draw the longest straight line through the pathway before it strikes something, whether it's a wall or a building or a tree or whatever. So notice some of the axial lines are very long and some of them are quite short. And Hillier is keen on the axiality because he says it's the axial quality which begins to help us understand how a particular pathway has potential for what degree of movement along it. And of course, in this village, most of the movement would be pedestrian, or maybe horse and cart, or horses. Uh, but this method will also work for vehicular roads. But uh, I, I just want to, I want you to be thinking about pedestrian movement as I give these examples. Next, integrated pathways versus segregated pathways. Each pathway in a pathway system has a different relationship to all the other pathways. Some of them are more integrated. Now what is an integrated pathway? It is a pathway into which many other pathways lead. So the assumption is because, uh, because many pathways lead into that pathway, the users on those other pathways are going to have to go onto that pathway to get somewhere else. So more than likely, potentially, that pathway, if it's well integrated, it's going to have more movement, a lot of movement along it. On the other hand, a segregated pathway is a pathway which has little, or uh, not little, uh, is that right? No, few. I want few or no other pathways uh, leading into, into it. So in this schematic pathway system, and this is entirely heuristic. You know what some of my students will say, well, Professor Seaman, you would never have this in the real world. Well, that's right. Uh, but it's heuristic. But notice, a pathway three 
is obviously the most segregated pathway in this system. It's a dead end street. Whereas pathway one, it has eight other pathways leading into it. So the assumption is that because it has these eight other pathways leading into it, folks uh, who live or work or whatever on these pathways are gonna have to get onto pathway one in order to go to some other destination within the settlement uh, system. And again, I'll have some uh, smart aleck who will say, yeah, but Professor Seaman, what if there's a big Walmart here at the end of this street? Uh, this street will be very much used. Well, that's true. But a Walmart is function. It's land use. And uh, we're not interested in that at this point. We're, we're, we're entirely interested only in pathway structure. That's a very important point to make. Eventually, Hillier and his research group uh, developed a series of um, numerical measurements to, uh, to um, pinpoint exactly, in terms of a number, the integration value for every pathway in a pathway system. And these are the formulas. I just want you to know there are mathematical formulas to cap uh, calculate this. So for every pathway, you get a unique value. And then you can take those values and you can rank them. And uh, Hillier and his research team have done this for several hundred settlements from uh, villages to uh, cities throughout the world. And what is so interesting is they discover that for many, not all, but many settlements, you have what Hillier has come to call the deformed wheel. And this is like a bicycle wheel which has been crushed in an accident. It's, it's, it can be very irregular as this one here. Uh, and this, this is the uh, integration map for the village we've been looking at. But all that it shows, the, the, the solid lines are the top quarter most integrated pathways. And the hatch lines are the bottom 10%. So they would be the segregated lines. And what you see immediately, and I think this is so interesting, is that you have these uh, least used pathways immediately next to the pathways that are the most used. And he calls this the deformed wheel. Now let me just show you a few characteristics of the deformed wheel. The rim, spokes, and hub of the wheel are the main entry routes into the settlement. Most of the shops, businesses, and major public spaces are located on these streets. So here, for example, these are the most integrated streets in the village. And each of these blobs are the major uh, plazas and other open spaces in the village. And you can see how there is a uh, fairly good uh, uh, correlation between these important open spaces and the most integrated streets. Finally, between the spokes of the active integrated streets are the more segregated, quiet pathways. And this is quite interesting because it means that in many pre-modern communities, you had uh, publicness and privacy immediately next to each other. In other words, you had shopping street, you had workplaces uh, very close to the residential, to the homes. And of course, this is something we lost after World War II, particularly with uh, low density, car based, uh, separated use, suburban development. Hillier also looks at the structure of the city, and this is washed out pretty badly, but this is an axial map of London in the 1990s. And what Hillier and his research group discover is that uh, many cities are deformed wheels within deformed wheels. And these deformed wheels, these smaller ones, they designate particular neighborhoods or districts. So for example, oh good, this is showing up pretty well. So this is the integration map for central London. And this is the River Thames. And I might, I've marked here with the uh, hatched oval the uh, city, which is the major financial district in London. Uh, let's see, Trafalgar Square would be over here. And the color code for this map is uh, hot colors versus cool colors. The hot colors are the most integrated pathways. The cool colors are the most segregated pathway, uh, pathways. Um, so for example, this is the reddest line 
in central London, and that's Oxford Street. And it's said that Oxford Street is the most heavily pedestrian uh, walkway in the world. Now, I want to look at the city just a little bit. Now, notice you've got a lot of yellow, orange lines here, and they crisscross. So you've got a lot of good con connectivity here. And also notice how the, this line, it moves over up through here. This moves up through here. In other words, the, the, the district itself is quite uh, permeable. But there's also a permeability and a connectedness which extends beyond throughout the entire older city. So um, here we have the site map for the city, the axial map, and the integration map. We have high permeability and connectivity. Uh, this is a situation of many possible routes within the district as well as through the district. And it's nicely integrated into the larger urban fabric. So this is what Hillier calls the deformed grid of the city proper. And this is a much different way of pathway structure than the direction we have moved, particularly in the United States after World War II with the dominance of the automobile, where you have what is called a hierarchical or tree-like uh, pathway system, where if you, if you live here, you have to get in your car, go down the street, go down here, and finally get to the arterial and perhaps get to the shopping mall, which is down here, so that uh, the uses are segregated. And very often, I mean here, for example, you might, you might live here, and you might want to get a pair of jeans at the gap here, but probably you've got to get in your car and go two or three miles in order to get there. Uh, and again, like with these events, and I could say so much more about uh, Bill Hillier's work, but I want to come back to uh, Merleau-Ponty. And why I bring Hillier into this talk in relation to Mer Merleau-Ponty is because he is suggesting that a quality of the world, in this case pathway structure, plays a major role in the manner of human movement and the way that um, intercorporeality unfolds. So these are some of the uh, issues. Uh, the pathway configuration of a place sustains a particular spatial field that draws users together or keeps them apart. Where and how users move through place is partly grounded in the lived body and its habitual extensions in time and space. An integrated, permeable spatial field can draw together the habitual routines of users and contribute to intercorporeality, place attachment, and a sense of environmental belonging. Finally, I want to draw the three folks together. Uh, these are the three points I would make. Uh, first of all, both these events in and Hillier illustrate ways in which pre-reflective bodily awareness and actions play an important role in the life world. These events and provides a language for locating unselfconscious visceral aspects of buildings and architectural meaning. And in that sense, his work has relationship to Merleau-Ponty's perception. On the other hand, Hillier illustrates how the spatiality of place specifically pathway configuration, supports or inhibits particular actions and routines of lived bodies as they come together or remain apart spatially, and therefore says something very important about the world component of body subject. I want to end with uh, Merleau-Ponty's discussion of phenomenology in the introduction to uh, phenomenology of perception. Like Merleau-Ponty's tacit pre-reflective phenomena of perception and lived embodiment, the experiential qualities pointed to by these events and in Hillier unfold at a pre-representational, unselfconscious level. It is only via directed attention and effort that these lived dimensions are made cerebrally present and as Merleau-Ponty says, brought to our notice.
Thank you.